Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us on our usual COVID roundup, Professor Satyajit Rath, and we're going to discuss two issues. What is a COVID death? Why we are going to discuss it is partly because the argument is excess death increased the number of COVID deaths unnecessarily, that's according to the government of India, and WHO's claims that excess deaths in some sense are related to uncounted COVID deaths. So that is why it's important to also argue, well, do we know what's really a COVID death and how well have we counted in India the number of COVID deaths, which otherwise have been recorded as deaths, but not maybe as COVID deaths. So to do that, we are going to ask Satyajit this question. Satyajit, what is a COVID death? Because as we know, from the controversies that had taken place earlier, both in the time of Delta as well as the earlier wave, that a lot of the reports which had been given, which the death certificates which had been given to the civil registry system, actually did not follow even the ICMR guidelines, which said COVID death, if you are having COVID and you die within a certain time frame, then it should be registered as COVID death as the immediate cause of death and other causes should come later. But we know from both Delhi as well as Gujarat where lots of examples came in the newspapers as well as evidence which have been uh, talked about by journalists looking at COVID protocols being followed during cremation and burial as well as looking at what the numbers were. Now, question two. You, and that's really a technical question. What is a COVID death? Because people really die according to some of the death reports, uh, death certificate reports due to heart stopping or the breathing stopping. Now, what does it really mean? So before we get into the technicalities of what is a COVID death, let's first get our um, intentions clear. What is our interest in counting these deaths? And there are three separate categories of deaths that I would uh, like all of us in these conversations to keep in mind, because counting these three separate categories of deaths has different consequences for public health policies. So the first category, the straightforward category, is what everybody is calling a COVID death, meaning that somebody is infected, somebody becomes virus test positive, somebody de develops, uh, that person develops difficulty in breathing, oxygen tension goes down, they're admitted to hospital, they go into cytokine storm, multi-system failure, get put on ventilator and die. That is a straightforward, no ambiguity, COVID death. And it should be recorded as such. Whether it has always been recorded as such, even in India's wanted civil registration system or not, is a separate question we will come to. But at least, technically, it should be counted as a COVID death. A second category of deaths is the kind of deaths where people are sick, people, are, um, people have chronic kidney disease, chronic lung disease, chronic heart disease, and um, are teetering on the edge of being well, ill for quite some time, and then they develop COVID. And the COVID, in one way or another, interacts with their basic chronic illness, and together, they are pushed into such a severe stage that they die. This is not necessarily the COVID illness being in and of itself so medically severe that it killed the individual, as much as this is a situation where any illness of this kind would have been the last straw on the camel's back that would have led to a pushing of the balance to its death. This is, let's call it a COVID associated death. This is important because for people who are severely ill already with other chronic uh, ailments, during the pandemic, COVID became an additional risk. 
And therefore, this category of deaths also needed to be identified, carefully recorded, and counted. The third category of deaths is what brings us into the excess death estimate territory, where what we are really looking at is statistical estimates of what is the normal pattern year by year of how many deaths in a particular area, in a particular community per million uh, individuals carefully segregated demographically tend to occur and how many actually occurred during the pandemic and the difference between those becomes then the count of excess deaths. And these excess deaths include our first category, that is the straightforward COVID severe illness killing people, include our second category of people who were quite chronically sick, but COVID became an additional last straw risk that took them all the way into death. And a whole large and poorly understood number of additional deaths which took place because of a variety of reasons ranging from people not getting enough food because livelihood damages, people um, dying because they were trying to walk back home, and of course people not getting medical care that they routinely needed. This includes preventive medical care, such as babies not getting vaccinated because vac uh, routine vaccination campaigns are uh, suspended with the result that avoidable childhood illnesses such as measles and uh, so on and so forth begin to spread in these um, communities of babies, cohorts of babies made vulnerable by the pandemic and some of them dying, all sorts of epidemic associated deaths. As you can imagine, all three categories of deaths need to be counted separately, need to be recognized separately, and need to be thought over separately as we begin to reformulate our public health policies, not simply as a short-term epidemic response, but over the long term. So in that sense, all these are COVID related, whether they are COVID deaths by the definition of ICMR or registered in the death certificate is really not the issue. And of course, as you've stated, there are COVID deaths which can be indirectly also related to COVID, other infectious deaths. But also, there would be a set of people who didn't go to hospitals, as you said, and they also died as a consequence. Of course, there are excess deaths because of this, but there could also be less deaths because a certain set of things did not happen. For example, I think we gave it last time, uh, deaths due to road accidents may have come down because of lockdowns. Uh, infectious diseases uh, like, for instance, influenza seems to have come down in lots of countries because, again, masking and social distancing as well as lockdowns. All of that might have contributed to coming down. So when you look at excess deaths for epidemiolog epidemiological reasons, what you're really talking about, the net excess deaths. So some which are more, some which are less. And the consequence of this is really the public health system because it has to cater what is the bandwidth it needs then to handle pandemics. And that is the crux of the reason why we are looking at what is a COVID debt and what are the excess debts. And now coming back to the, therefore, the, the public health issue that you've raised, we are not, by all accounts, we have not reached a st stage when we can call it endemic, though what is endemic or not is itself a major debate. Becoming endemic doesn't become, doesn't mean that we are now okay. Everything is hunky-dory. After all, you had you have tuberculosis, which is endemic. It doesn't mean, therefore, it's not a killer. And earlier also, smallpox was, a, it was endemic. Polio was endemic. It still meant that public health systems had to gear up for that. So endemic doesn't mean becoming safe. So that is one question that we've already addressed. But Satyajit, we have Professor Srinath Reddy, who's written about that we now need to look at 
uh, this particular COVID-19 COVID disease as something which should be the way we look at floods. That it doesn't mean that we sound alarm every time the rains start, but we are prepared for the fact that floods may happen and therefore we have to take steps. What does it mean when he talks about public health system, therefore being to be treated like we gear up every rainy season for the floods? So, um, Professor Reddy's uh, piece in today's uh, Indian Express is uh, interesting, instructive, and appropriate. Um, I must confess that for me, it doesn't go far enough. So, um, and let me explain that. He gives an interesting analogy, which I must to uh, thank him for pointing out, I had not thought of this, um, with a flood control system um, at, at a variety of levels of preventive measures of floods and so on and so forth, and uh, of uh, warning signs and calibrated responses. And, and, and there is, there is um, a great deal of substance in that comparison. Here is where I think Professor Reddy doesn't, Professor Reddy's piece at least, doesn't quite go far enough. I, I won't venture to say Professor Reddy doesn't go far enough. Um, and that is, the one question that is not asked in his piece is, how well do our flood control systems work? How well do our public health systems in response to already endemic diseases of the kind that you pointed out, Kabir, um, influenza, um, tuberculosis, um, until relatively recently polio, how well did these systems actually work? How well do they work? How well, as citizens of India, are we accustomed to seeing them work? And I would argue, that that is the point where Professor Reddy's piece stops, where we, all of us, as citizen activists attempting to use the lessons of the pandemic to bring about durable change, have to begin thinking forward. We have to begin to ask, how are all the components that go into such a multi-layered, multi-faceted public healthcare system that plans for the environment, that plans for disease surveillance, that plans for good warning, that plans for test and vaccine development pipelines, and as and when necessary, provides calibrated decisions to communities, takes them into confidence if acute measures, if, if, if crisis measures become necessary. For all of this to be put together as a system, what do we need? What are all the components that will go into this? is a far more fundamental question than simply thinking about the technological factors of, can we diagnose a virus? Can we develop a vaccine? Can we um, uh, get enough ventilators out? Is, is, can we make enough oxygen? And so on and so forth. That, I think, is going to be where the bulk of productive energies in health activism will have to be focused over coming months and years. That actually raises three issues. We're not going to discuss these three issues today, but maybe next time we should. That one is to make medicines and vaccines available widely and cheaply. Now that we have at least anti antivirals, so how to make that available to the public at large? because this is something which then people, if this available over the counter, then can do themselves or get a prescription from a doctor and go and get cheap antivirals if they're available. So that is one. The second is, of course, vaccines, very important, and how to bring the cost of vaccines down and make it available widely. How to 
treat vaccines as an essential part of pandemic control, or COVID-19 control for the future. And third, and I think the most critical element when you come to deaths, is the bandwidth. And you have talked about it time and again in our discussions, that the real issue is when you have a flood, well, you need to go to flood shelters. You have to leave take people out to different heights from the low-lying area. Similarly, when people fall seriously ill, you need to take them to the hospitals, and the hospitals should have, in, in fact, intensive care beds available to handle that. In fact, one of the arguments that China has been giving is that we have intensive care beds which are one-tenth that of uh, the United States, and we are about five times their population. That is why you are forced to go for a no-COVID uh, policy because we just can't handle what would otherwise uh, happen. Now, whether that's a correct argument or not, that's a separate topic for discussion. But certainly what we saw in the Delta wave, the loss of lives was directly related to the availability of oxygen and intensive care beds. So I think these are the three elements which, according to you, I think also, uh, Srinath, Professor Srinath Reddy may have put some indicative, uh, uh, at least directions of what we need to do, but they are the hard ones because that is money, that is uh, political will, and there is also the need to develop the science and technology network that the country had, which you seem to be handling, handing over to private capital or similar profit-minded uh, institutions, including multinationals. Any last thoughts on that before we close the discussion? Well, it, at the risk of uh, extending an already long conversation, let me remind all of us of a parallel. We have been talking about antibiotic resistance bacterial infections, and we've been talking about development and deployment of antibiotics. Simultaneously, we've been talking, of, we've been bemoaning the fact that easy and free availability of antibiotics has actually led to antibiotic resistance as a problem, or at least has contributed to the emergence of the seriousness of the problem. And what that pa peculiar paradox points to is that simply the technological fix of making antibiotics, which are antibacterials or antiviral drugs widely and cheaply available, although a crucial component of the response, cannot be the entirety of the response. A multifaceted, decentralized, people-centric healthcare system is fundamental. So on that note, a good people-centric, public health system. I think we'll close this discussion. Do visit our website and do look at our shows.